On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. And he finally said that the most important one, and he called it Only Connect. And it was a quote from an E.M. Forster novel. And this man said, this is the most important trait by far that anyone who has had a liberal arts education should have. And what he meant was that people who had this ability had the freedom to connect to different ideas, different traditions, different possibilities. They had the freedom to connect to the community. And so I love that. Sally Robinson is a civic leader and community volunteer whose contributions have shaped education, arts, and culture in Charlotte and Durham. She has served on many boards, including the Charlotte Symphony, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, the McCall Center for Visual Arts, the Foundation for the Carolinas, and Duke University. Sally was the visionary force behind the launch of the Levine Museum of the New South. She has received many awards for her service, including the Duke University Distinguished Alumni Award, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte Distinguished Service Award, the John Tyler Caldwell Award for the Humanities, the Charlotte Woman of the Year Award, and the Arts and Science Council Lifetime Commitment Award. In this episode, we explore community service, becoming a better person, connecting to ideas and possibilities, and a lifelong relationship of friendship and love. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Sally, you have led this remarkable life, and you have made and continue to make such a difference in the city of Charlotte. I'd like to begin at the beginning and talk about your life and what's important to you. You grew up a native Charlottean. Where was your home? My home was on the corner of Queens Road and Oxford Place. And when I was born in 1934, My parents had been in the house since 1921. And when they moved in, and until about 1930, Oxford Place was just a dirt road. And then it was paved as the church was built, Mice Park Presbyterian. So I never knew it as a dirt road, but it was. And there was a large expanse of woods just across from the church which was developed by, actually, by German prisoners of war during the Second World War. But when I was a kid, my brothers, who were older than I, I have four older brothers who are now 98, 96, 94, and 92, and they spent many hours and nights in those woods camping out. So it was a great place to grow up. Sally, there is a home now on the corner of Queens Road and Oxford Place. Is that the same home you grew up in? It's the same home. And I give thanks that it's never been torn down. Sally, you had a friend back then named Boots Barber. And you and Boots would often go into the woods together. That's right. Boots lived on Beverly Drive, just around the corner from Oxford Place. And she was a tomboy, just as I was. Uh, When my mother finally had a girl, she thought, great, a girl at last. But I turned out to be a tomboy, and Boots was too. And so we played football in my backyard 
But then we got more ambitious and went out into the woods. We found a dead possum, and we weren't quite sure whether it was a possum, but we brought it home and showed it to my mother, who said, yes, it's a possum, but get it out of this house. (laughs) But we spent many times in the woods, and the most exciting time for us, it was in World War II. It would be probably near the end of the war, and a lot of German prisoners were brought back to this country uh, to do work building roads and projects that could not be done by our servicemen who are fighting the war. So when Boots and I were probably 11 or 12 years old, a group of German prisoners developed the section there that's Hampton Avenue, going all the way down to where Christ Church is now. And Boots and I developed a good friendship with those German prisoners. And one of the funny things is that chewing gum was rationed during the war days, so it was hard for us to get chewing gum. But the German prisoners received chewing gum as part of the food and goodies they were given uh, while they were prisoners. And so they shared their chewing gum with us. And I actually have a wrapper that I kept that one of the prisoners gave to us. And as I look back, my parents, who had four boys in the war, uh, three in Germany fighting the Germans, they did not mind a bit that I was out being friends with these German prisoners. It did not bother them a bit. They just said to Boots and me, be kind to those men. I guess that chewing gum was one benefit of winning the war. Absolutely. <laughs> Sally, tell me about your parents, the Daltons. What do you remember about your dad? Well, my dad, he was a wonderful person. And what's interesting is that my father was 50 years old when I was born. So he was a good 10 to 15 years older than the fathers of my friends. And they called him Mr. Bob, which always amused me. But one of the things I loved is that my friend's parents, my friend's fathers in particular, when they would get upset with us, they would talk loud, they would threaten a spanking. My father never spoke loud, never threatened a spanking. I don't know what it was, but just his manner encouraged us to be good and polite. He was a wonderful man. I think he probably thought, I don't know what to do with a girl, but he was a loving dad, and I used to enjoy so much in what we call the back sitting room, sitting with my dad, and he would read me parts of stories he was reading in the Saturday Evening Post. And then occasionally he would encourage me to help him with the crossword puzzle that at that time was in the Charlotte News, and he was working on I adored my father. Your dad's name was Robert Dalton? Yes. What kind of work did he do? He was a salesman, a textile machinery salesman for the White Machine Works Company. The headquarters was in Massachusetts, but when the rail lines developed to the extent they did, it was very easy for Whiten to open an office in Charlotte, and the office was uptown just off of a south of Trine Street. Uptown was downtown then. <laughs> That's right. Uptown, downtown. <laughs> what do you remember about the city when you were a young girl? Oh, my goodness. What was so special is how our parents let us roam the city. Now, the city was very much smaller, but for example, when I was at AG, that was seventh through ninth grade, and AG is where the doubt why is today. And after school, my girlfriends and I would walk to town, that is the square, up where trying to trade intersect. We would cross the railroad tracks, walk uptown, and often go to either the Imperial or the Carolina Theater for a late afternoon matinee, and then catch the bus and come home. Our parents felt very comfortable letting us do what we wanted to just as long as we got home in time for supper. Now, there was nothing 
shopping centers, never heard of them in Charlotte at that time. Everything was uptown. The department stores, we went to Belk's, Eford's, Ivy's. There were seven movie theaters within two blocks of the square. And that's where the life was, the five and ten cent stores. Oh, it was great. It was all uptown. Sally, your mom was a great influence in your life, wasn't she? Yes, indeed. My mother, when I was born, had had four boys in eight years. There was six-year pause. I think maybe they thought they had all the children they were going to. And then I showed up, and my mother, I heard her say in later days, I thought I was going to have a little girl I could dress up. But she had a little girl that wanted to be like her older brothers. And I was very much of a tomboy. I played football in the backyard. I had boxing gloves that belonged to my brothers. And so my mother had to settle for a tomboy. But I found out that in her childhood, she was something of a tomboy too. But my mother impressed me so much. First of all, when war came, I'll never forget. December the 7th, we were visiting my grandparents in Greenville, South Carolina, and it was a celebratory luncheon for one of my aunts, and the news came in, and the sudden quietness there in the dining room, because several of the parents there, my aunts and uncles, my my folks, had boys that they knew would be called up. And riding home that afternoon, I was in the back seat, mother and dad were driving, And the serious conversation between the two of them really made me aware of what was to come. And my mother dealt with this by really getting involved in the war effort as much as women could do in those days. One of her prides and joy was all four boys were in the service, so she had a pen with four stars on it. It was not unusual for the mothers to have pens, but mother was the only person we knew that had four stars on hers. And everything revolved around the war. We were asked to have sandbags on the front porch because the first year of the war, there was concern there may be bombing. My mother was very active in being sure we all saved the grease from cooking bacon and other meats because grease was collected early on. We had a victory garden, quite a big one, in our backyard. But more than that, my mother got involved in, uh, for example, we would have uh, servicemen from Morris Field. That was our Air Force base outside Charlotte. We would have servicemen on Sundays come in, and mother would invite young ladies over, not my age, but these were young college ladies, over, and we'd put the Victrolas, we called it, in the living room and raise the window, and there would be dancing out on the porch. Mother was so involved in that. And then she got involved in the community chess, which is what we now call the United Way. One reason she got involved is some of the funds that were gathered there we used to have things for servicemen. So that drew her to it. And I was so proud of her because her picture was in the paper on several occasions. And near the end of the war, uh, when uh, the city purchased a, a parcel of land to make into Freedom Park, my mother and a friend of hers were the co-chairman of the Women's Auxiliary to raise funds for Freedom Park. So my mother set an early example for me during the war days. But more than that, she was president of the YWCA, very active with the DAR, and I was just wanted to be like her. Sally, your brothers did serve in the war. Yes. Were there any issues that came up with their service? Oh, absolutely. Of the th- four boys, three I went in right away within the first year. The other boy, Harry, was younger, so he did not go in until about eight months before the war was over, and we were blessed that he was never shipped overseas. But the first three, the oldest boys, Bob, Rufus, and Jim, all served in Europe. Two of the boys received Purple Hearts. Uh, One of them was wounded to the extent that he 
had to be shipped from France back to uh, England for maybe three or four months of hospitalization, but then went straight back. Uh, two of the boys in Europe were in the infantry. Uh, one of them received a battlefield commission, uh, which was quite an honor. He was a Ford observer in the war. Both were entrymen. The third brother who was there was part of the military police. He went as far up as the trucks and tanks could do in terms of, of directing their traffic. So he was a hero, too. All three boys got home safely. Actually, uh, two of the boys, Rufus and Bob, stayed over after the war was over for about a year in the occupational forces and then they came home together on the same ship, took the same taxi from the bus station, and when they got to our house, there were 24 or so neighbors and family welcoming them home. But my mother and father, everything revolved around the war. For example, we woke up each morning and turned on Bob Trout to hear the news. At lunchtime, my mother turned on H.V. Caltonborn. And at night, my mother and father and I gathered around the radio to listen to Edward R. Murrow. We had a map that my father hung in what we called the playroom. And he and I took little needle points or pinpoints with flags on them to trace where the boys were stationed. So, and our postman, Mr. Parnell, I'll never forget his name, he would ring the doorbell twice when there was a letter from one of the boys. So our whole lives revolved around our brothers and their sons in the war. That's a time of unity and patriotism that we've never experienced again. Absolutely. Everybody was pulling on the same oar. It was amazing. Sally, you went to boarding school. Where did you go, and what were your memories? Well, my mother and father had decided that their children would do well to take two years away at boarding school. So that worked well for three of my brothers, who were sent to Macaulay for the last two years. But my brother Jim did not want to go. He argued with uh, mother and dad, and they told him he could stay. So he did graduate from Central. I went to Central High for one year, and I was eager to go away because I felt I was kind of goofing off and felt it would be good for me to get a change and to go off. And so my folks allowed me to look at several schools, that is, look at the bulletins of the school. In those days, you did not travel around and look at three and four places. And the one I liked was St. Mary's in Raleigh, and I think part of that was that three of my four brothers went to NC State, and my brother Harry, the youngest, was still at State. Uh, after he got out of the Navy, he was still at State when I went off to St. Mary's. So I went for two years. It was hugely important in my life because I really settled in. I wanted to do make good grades. I wanted to be a leader, and I was able to achieve that as I look back, better in a surrounding of all girls than I was in a big school of boys and girls. So it was very important to my life. Sally, just before you went off to St. Mary's, you had a first date with a certain someone. Oh, yes. Who was that person? That was Russell Robinson. Uh, We had grown up less than a mile apart. He went to Eastover Elementary, and but I went to Miles Park Elementary, but we both ended up at AG. I will say, though, we actually went to Miss Lockhart's kindergarten together. He was one year older, and so I didn't really see much of him there, but we have pictures showing that we were both there at the same time. So I saw Russ when one night, it was my last year at AG, and there was a party, and you weren't put with dates. You just showed up. The girls and the boys showed up. The parents took you. But there was a boy named Russ Robinson 
who had just gotten his license. And so he picked up his girlfriend and then picked up three other girls who were spending the night together. I was one of those girls. And so we went to the party, and then he brought us home. And by the time I got home, I'd already gotten a crush on Russ. So I was so pleased when I was 15 that we had our first date. As I say, he had his driver's license. We went to a movie, and then he brought me home. I went off to St. Mary's and hoping that I would see more of him, which I did. And by the time I graduated from high school, we were definitely sweethearts. And your time as sweethearts continued when you went off to Duke University and you studied history. Why history? I had always enjoyed listening to the analysis of the news, particularly Edward R. Morrow. And that drew me to being interested in why were the Germans the way they were? What was it about the British that made them so brave doing the, the Blitz? And so it drew me to the feeling that I wanted to know more about those things. And then when I went to St. Mary's, I had this wonderful teacher named Miss Mabel Morrison. She had a British accent. Her family grew up in Nova Scotia, but she had this wonderful British accent. And she taught English history. And I fell in love with English history, developed a crush on her, just wanted to be her student forever and ever. And she scared me a little because she was quite strict. But I'll always thank Miss Morrison for turning me on to history, particularly English history, and it's still my favorite history to study. Sally, while you were in your first years at Duke University, Russ was off at Princeton University. Yes. And then he returned to Duke to go to law school. Well, it was a little bit before that. Russ went to Princeton, and I went to Duke when I was a freshman at Duke, Russ was a sophomore at Princeton, but we were, we were really, we were almost in love at that point. And he had me up twice uh, to Princeton. Oh my goodness, I was so excited and I was so impressed with Princeton. And we just had a wonderful time. And he came down a couple of times to Duke. One of the funny things is, you don't see this much now, but uh, boys did not mind thumbing in those days. And several times, he thumbed down all the way from Princeton to Duke. And by thumbing, you mean hitchhiking. Yes, yes, that's it. Well, he didn't tell his mother and father that he, they would, that he was doing that. He didn't think they would like it. And so his mother, uh, one day near the end of that first year, when we were dating that much, she said, Russell, you've been such a good sport to not be upset that Sally's that far away. Your father and I want to give you a train ticket so you can take the train down. I think this will be the first time you've been to Duke. He did not tell her that he had been down three other times by thumbing. <laughs> so, but anyway, after that, after Russ had had two years at Princeton and I had had one year at Duke, he said to me, would you marry me at some point soon? And I said, yes, but we're, we're not quite ready yet. And he said, no, we're not. I'm transferring to Duke so that we can date for one more year, and then I hope we can get married. So he came to Duke, and it was a great year having him there. I, I think he missed Princeton because it, it was a, a great, great school, and I'll have to tell you this. I'm going to brag on Russ. Russ did so well in his studies there that right before he left, one of the professors told him that he would be considered for a Rhodes Scholarship if he stayed. Now, he may not have gotten it, but he was doing that well that they said that to him. He was also playing baseball and running track, so he had that well-roundedness. But he didn't tell me that for, oh gosh, four or five years later. But he did come to Duke. And so we were married after my sophomore year. And we spent the next three years living in Poplar Apartments, 
with other married students, all of whom were graduate students. Russ had just started law school. In those days, if your grades were good enough, uh, Duke would allow you to go to law school instead of your senior year. So for three years, we lived in Poplar Apartments. The first of those three years, I was a junior and senior, and he was first and second year law school. And then when I graduated, I almost immediately became pregnant with our first child, Cammy, who was born in Durham. And so that's how we started our married life. Sally, you went to college at a time when many women who went to college went to find a suitable man to get married. What was the expectations of your family, and how did you feel about marrying at such a young age? Let me answer this by going back. When I was at St. Mary's and the Korean War started, St. Mary's at that time was a junior college, and I'll never forget an assembly when Dean Jones, who was dean of St. Mary's students, got up and gave a very impassioned address to the women who were freshmen and sophomores in college and pleaded with them not to drop out and get married, but to finish that education and when the men came home from the war to get married. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I can't imagine dropping out and getting married and not be in school. So That background surprised me that so many young women as freshmen, sophomores around the country were dropping out to get married. Now, to the question of what was my idea of of young women going to college, maybe to find a suitable beau or husband, I don't remember much of that among my friends. It certainly wasn't something I was thinking of. And I don't know if that was prevalent when we were in college in the early 50s or more so earlier on, but it doesn't resonate with me. Sally, you began your family life with Russell in the 1950s. We often see images of 1950s housewives whose talents and skills are constrained by being a homemaker. Did you ever feel limited as a homemaker in the 1950s? No, I did not. And part of that perhaps, is that my own mother was always a homemaker, and yet she did a lot of volunteer work. So I did not feel constrained, and as soon as Russ and I came back to Charlotte, we had two other children. Within six years, we had three children, and it never occurred to me to do something outside being a volunteer. And I'll tell you, this is interesting When I came back, the one organization people kept telling me I would have to join was the Junior League. So I did. Uh, The Junior League in that time was really one of the very few women's organizations available. That was the Charlotte Women's Club, which was also a, a wonderful group. But this Junior League was something that My mother had been a member of, all of my brother's wives that lived in junior league cities were members of, and so the combination of having the junior league, which took up a fair amount of time, and being a homemaker and a mother, that was all I could possibly get in. What is your memory of Charlotte in the 1950s, and what was the mood of the place? In the early 50s, Everything still centered around Uptown. But while we were living, we lived in a home in an area called Cotswold. And we lived there from 10 years, from 57 to 67. And during that time, some major changes took place. Cotswold Mall was built, and I remember South Park coming along not too long after that period. So the Charlotte that I grew up in pretty well stayed the Charlotte I grew up in until the late 50s and 60s. And that's when things like the Park Road Shopping Center, Cotswold South Park, made it a different place. And unfortunately, that had eventually a bad effect on Uptown because people would were excited about being able to drive just a little way to go to the mall. 
And so it changed Uptown, uh, much to my regret, and a lot of those who remembered how everything was Uptown, and we missed that. In fact, Charlotte stayed that way and got worse in terms of after 5 o'clock, there was nothing going on. Fortunately, now that's turned around. And when Russ and I are uptown going to the symphony or some such event, there are young people and people I age every night of the week out on the streets, restaurants. It's wonderful. But it, it, it did go through, I think, a gloomy change when the uptown gave way to all of the suburban shopping centers. Sally Charlotte was very segregated in the 1950s and 1960s. What was your view of the civil rights movement at the time and how Charlotte responded? Well, first let me say that I'm not proud of myself that I grew up as a child in the 30s and 40s and 50s accepting segregation. I didn't think, why is it this way? I got on the bus and sat on the front and African Americans sat on the back. And I would go to the train station and see white and colored. And as a kid, and even as a teenager, I didn't question it. My family was devoted to the African Americans that worked in our home. We all were. But it wasn't a quality of life for them that it should have been when they went home. The first time it really hit me is I was at Central High School and a friend of mine who was a wonderful girl, we were good friends, her father had rental houses in Brooklyn and he had a certain mindset that was not what my mother and father had. But my friend, walking home from Central one day, had an experience that she told me about. And when she told me what she did was the first time I thought, whoa, something's really wrong. And what she told me, and I will not use the word, but she told me she was walking home down what had then been developed to a slight degree, King's Drive, and she saw ahead of her coming in at her from a different direction, two African-American teenagers. And she expected them to step off the sidewalk for her. And when they didn't, she said, get out of my way. And you know what word she used. And she came home and from school and called me up and said, let's get together in the yard. So we went. She said, let me tell you what happened to me today. And I was horrified. And I thought, this, this is not right. But it took me that long to really notice that. When Russ and I were getting ready to move from Charlotte to Poplar Apartments in Durham, this was right before we got married, Russell's mother allowed us to take Sam, who was their yard man, in the car with us. We had a little trailer because we had furniture to take. So... Sam was in the back seat, Russ and I were up front, the trailer was in the back, and when we pulled into Durham, it was time to get some lunch. And I said, Russ, where do you think we should stop? I don't know where a place is exactly, we just want a bite. And Sam said from the back seat, let me off here, and I'll be here after you get your lunch. He knew that he could not go in with us. We hadn't even thought about it at that point. So we let Sam off and we got a hot dog or something somewhere else and picked him up. So those were two eye-openers for me. Kind of late, but nevertheless. Russ and I both found ourselves feeling very strongly that the civil rights movement was the right one. The people working particularly down at Selma, all those places. We were inspired by them. We thought they were heroes. We weren't doing anything ourselves, but we really felt it was important, and we applauded 
what was happening. And the busing was important. I'll, I'll tell you another thing I'm not proud of is that when busing began, we sent our children to Charlotte Country Day School because sort of the word was, if you, if you want a good education, you better take them out because they will be bused. And the children were third grade. And we did. And I feel bad about that as I look back because we had some great friends, including Dick and Meredith Spangler, who kept their children in public schools. They, they were bused in junior high and senior high. And they both, as parents, were very active. And I look back on that, and I think I wish we'd had the courage to do that, too. But we didn't. Sally, your views on race relations began to evolve then. How did it continue to evolve? Well, they began to evolve more when I was blessed to get involved in some volunteer work where I got to meet African-American citizens of this city. And those people changed my life. Uh, They enriched them amazingly so. Clarence Johnson, who was the African-American director of the St. Francis Job Program, became one of my best friends, spent many an hour in our home, and we worked together on this program and I had the chance during some five, ten years of working with this program to get to know and be a mentor to many African-American teenagers who had dropped out of school and we were trying to work with them to get them into Central Piedmont and then find their first jobs. A couple of those students, one in particular, I'll never forget, uh, just two years ago, he's married and has children called me up and came by and we had a visit. His name is Terry. And I'm just so proud that Terry's my friend. So my feelings began to change then and they've continued. Elizabeth Randolph was an amazing African-American woman who graduated, I believe it was Bennett College, and came to Charlotte and was in education, became principal of several schools, became associate superintendent of schools for a time, I believe. But I first met her when I went on the public library board in 1980. And she took me under her wing and taught me how to be a board member. She was fabulous as a friend. We traveled together to Chapel Hill where we stayed together at the Carolina Inn for North Carolina Library Association event. We were great friends. We served on several boards. When I was getting involved with the Museum of the New South, I called her immediately. She joined that board. And she just taught me so much. And we kept up even when she was really failing in health and When she died, I was asked to speak at her funeral. And I just have to say that Libby is one of the key people that helped me grow up to be a better person. But there are a lot of others like Sarah Stevenson and Teresa Eldon. Oh, I could name on and on who have meant so much to me and enriched my life. Sally, in the 1980s and 1990s, you began to become quite active in Charlotte. What led to your involvement in civic life? Well, I think I always wanted to follow my mother and to be active in civic life. I'll tell you, though, it took some time for me to really feel passion about any of the work I was doing. In the Junior League, I thoroughly enjoyed the camaraderie of the women, but What I enjoyed the most was serving on the board, being chairman of nominating, or I was even treasurer of all things. But I enjoyed the board work, but I really didn't much enjoy the community work that was offered through that. And that was a disappointment. And so I would have to say that it was through 
my church first that I found something that really, really appealed to me. And that was a program that was started. There were seven churches that went together uh, to try to find some community work that we could do. And it ended up, I was involved with Bob Daniels from our church uh, in helping to start something that we call the St. Francis Jobs Program. And that's where we worked with young African Americans aged uh, 16 to 18 who had dropped out of school and who we wanted to try to get back in school through Central Piedmont's program where they would give the GED to students who came back in, took a certain amount of courses. It was really the equivalent of a high school diploma. And so that was, oh, I loved it. It was not just the opportunity to help start something, which is exciting, but it was working with these young people and seeing the difference that we could make in their lives. So that began my passion for civic work. And then that within a year of that, I was asked to be on the Charlotte MacBurg Library Board where I met Libby Randolph and so many other wonderful people. And I went on, had an opportunity to chair that board during an exciting time when the library that is now there was built. And so I I wouldn't give anything for those two wonderful opportunities in the 1980s. And though there were other things I did, too, I went sometime during the end of the 80s, I think, maybe it was 90s, on our church's vestry and became the first woman senior warden. And that was great, too. But until then, I didn't have much passion for the things I was trying to do in the community. Sally, in the early 1990s, you became quite passionate about a new opportunity that became the Museum of the New South. How did that come about? Well, it's interesting how that happened. And the timing was so exquisite, really. My mother, whom I tried to be like in so many ways in civic life, died in the summer of 1990 at age 93. So I was missing her, of course, but wondering what I should do next in the community, thinking of her. And one day I got a call from a Miss Ann Batten. And she said, Sally, this is Miss Batten. And I said, oh, Miss Batten, I haven't heard your voice in years. She was my eighth grade homeroom teacher. And she said, Sally, I'm chairman of the Mecklenburg Historical Society. May I come by with two of my board members would want to talk with you about something. And, of course, I said, yes, ma'am. And she came by and she said, we think we need a history museum in Charlotte and wonder if you would undertake to start one. And we would give you support as best we could, and we could make a financial grant if you want to bring in a consultant. And usually I talk with Russ about things like that, but with Miss Batten asking me, I just said, yes, ma'am. But I did say this. I said, Miss Batten, I will do it if you're all right with this. I'm on the Arts and Science Council, and it had just decided, the council, not to have any new buildings for up to five years because cultural groups we already had were in some difficulty, we needed to put our emphasis there. So I said, Miss Batten, if you agree that we wouldn't have a building for at least five years, and if you agree that it would be a museum that looked at Charlotte after the Civil War, I could do it, but not if you had to have a building, and not if you didn't delineate the period of history because The Charlotte History Museum does that early history, and they do it well. So those are the two grants. And she said, all right, we'll do it. And they gave a grant, I think it was $6,000, which was a lot of money in those days. And they said, let us know how we can help. And I had the best time because, as I've said before, nothing is more exciting than helping to start something. So I plunged in and 
people were great. They responded. I think they saw the need for such an institution. And I had these wonderful people like Marcia Simon, a great community leader that agreed, Pepper Dowd, another community leader. And I had just met the year before at a luncheon someone I had more fun talking to, Sandra Levine. And so I, I thought, I'm going to call Sandra and go by, see if she'll do it. And she did it. And what was funny, she told me years later, she said, Sally, you kept talking about this museum without walls. Who ever heard of such a thing? But I decided I'd do it anyway. And so for three or four years, uh, we really worked hard to get it going. And Bob Sink was a from a, Robinson Bradshaw was hugely important. He did all the bylaws. He got us a nonprofit status, was our second board chair. And up to five years, we didn't have a building. But Frieda Nicholson, the wonderful head of Discovery Place, told me one day, she said, Sally, you need a building. I've got just the building for you. It's for sale. And it's the building we're in now. And we uh, went and we saw it was for sale, and so John Stedman, whom I forgot to mention, but he was a great community leader, loved fundraising, and when I told him that it was for sale, but we have to come up with a million dollars or thereabouts, he said, we can do that. Let's see if we can't get money from the arts and cultural division of the of state government. So he took me to meet with some representatives he knew all those people, and sure enough, after about a year with additional fundraising, we were able to buy the building and start the Museum of the New South. And then a few years later, we remodeled and named it from our major giver, Leon Levine, and it's been the joy of my life to be involved. And Emily Zimmerman replaced the wonderful Robert Weiss, who was our founding director, and it's just amazing what those people did. Uh, to make the museum what it is today. Sally, you went on to serve on many boards, the Charlotte Symphony, the Arts and Science Council, the McCall Center for Visual Arts, and many others. As you think back on your civic leadership in Charlotte, is there an issue or cause that upon reflection you might have led in a more active or visible way? I really don't think so because the library, the museum, the St. Francis Jobs Program, the ones that really I got involved with. I gave it my all, and I loved every minute. Now, one one thing I will say, <laughs> this group didn't need my help. It was already beautifully established. But it did mean a lot to me to serve on the foundation for the Carolinas. I learned a lot being on that board. There really wasn't anything I needed to do, but listen carefully and learn and help in any way I could. But what a fantastic job Michael Marsicano has done in setting that up. And it was a great privilege for me to be on that board. Sally, the Robinson Center for Civic Leadership opened at the Foundation for the Carolinas. What are your reflections on the center, the work that has been done and the work that it has yet to do? Well, I'll start by saying that Russ and I were totally surprised with the naming of the center. Uh, we had been asked to come to a meeting to discuss some work that some of us had been doing to try to encourage individuals in Charlotte to sign up to be involved in more leadership at the foundation, bringing on new people, and we had had some good luck with that. And this was supposed to be just an evening to celebrate that. And halfway through, we sat down to have a meal, and Michael announced that. And Russ and I were totally dumbfounded, had no idea that that had been done, just blown away by it. But some very generous individuals, including our children <laughs> had participated in that. We just knew nothing of it. Kathy Bassant, who was on the board then, I think had a big role in helping Bank of America do that. And 
it just was amazing. And we've always been extremely grateful for that. What a surprise. As for the center itself, I, I think they're doing wonderful work. I think they are always looking to expand their efforts to, to build up what they do. They do have a group that joins each year as members. They have programs for that group. I think it's quite good. But I do know, and knowing Michael, that he wants to expand it and develop it even more. Sally, what is on your mind today as you think about Charlotte in 2019? Well, as I think about Charlotte, what I want for Charlotte is for it continue to be an embracing community. I think that we have done a lot in moving in that direction, but then the episodes of the last few years have been strenuous. I think we still need to connect better with people that we've not connected with as well before. I will say this, I have always sort of inspired myself by collecting quotes that I've read that mean a lot to me. And I think the quote that means the most to me is, this was an article that came out in one of the learned magazines, and it was a question where a professor in the Midwest was asked, what really shows a person has had a liberal arts education? And he listed 10 reasons, and some of them were not very deep, just someone who continued to read, maybe someone who, who did crossword puzzles, and then he built up. And he finally said that the most important one, and he called it Only Connect. And it was a quote from an E.M. Forster novel. And this man said, this is the most important trait by far that anyone who has had a liberal arts education should have. And what he meant was that people who had this ability had the freedom to connect to different ideas, different traditions, different possibilities. They had the freedom to connect to the community. And so I love that. And I think that as I look at Charlotte now, I see a lot of positive signs, but I also see some signs that show we need to take greater steps to connect with different ideas, different possibilities, different people. And so to me, that's the goal that I would love for Charlotte to have. And it's certainly a goal that as individuals we want to have. I want to be someone who can connect Sally, you mentioned the liberal arts, Duke University, and your connection to Duke University all these years means so much to you. Oh, it does. And uh, it started because of mothers uh, and dads, four boys, my brothers, three of them went to NC State. And of course, NC State in those days did not take women. My brother Jim didn't want to get into textiles, so he chose Duke. And Duke took women from the time it was started. So immediately, and I adored all my brothers, I thought, well, I can at least go where Jim went. So as a little girl, I followed Duke football on the radio. There was just no question that that's where I wanted to go. And so I did go to Duke. And it was just great for me. It was, it was a different thing than I thought because part of my time at Duke, I was married. So I was not on campus, but those four years, the intellectual life that Duke provided for me was amazing, and I loved it. And as I've mentioned, I majored in history. I got that interest from Dr. Morrison at St. Mary's, but at Duke there was Dr. Nelson and Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Bevins and these people that fed this love of history and also literature, that was very much connected. Reading the English novel, studying under Dr. Budd, not just American history, but the writers of the time. And 
it's interesting, the word connect came up there for me too, because I remember one time I was driving our little car that Russ and I had between East and West Campus, and it suddenly hit me that all the courses that I'd been taking that year, whether it was history, philosophy, art, literature, that they were all connected. And that was a great moment for me. And it, it just made me so grateful for the liberal arts education Duke gave me. Now, after we graduated, we continued to follow it with basketball. And, uh, but I wasn't involved in, in Duke. I wasn't much for reunions. I've just never been much for reunions. <laughs> so I really wasn't doing anything at Duke. Uh, I was busy in Charlotte. But Russ, at that point, was uh, on the Duke Endowment. And so one time we went to Linville, where we have a, uh, an old house up there in the summer. He got a call that the president of Duke, Nan Cohan, uh, wanted to come to the mountains and thought there were enough alum that they could put together a dinner and she could speak and wondered if she might stay with us. And so she did. And I just had the greatest admiration for Nan. She came from President Wellesley to be Duke's first woman president. She was great. We talked a lot. She stayed two nights. And I just thought she was spectacular. Well, about six months later, I got this phone call. And it was Nan Cohan. And she said, Sally would you consider being on the Duke board? And I said, man, that never entered my mind that I would ever be asked to do that. Of course I would, but just know that if it doesn't work out, you just made my day even mentioning it. Well, somehow she twisted a few arms, and I went on the board in 1995. And I adored every minute of it. My work in Charlotte and the work in able to do at Duke as volunteers has meant so much to me. Sally, you and Russ have been married for over 65 years. Your marriage is a model of love and partnership to many people. What is it about your relationship that works so well? Well, I think, I think really it's because besides being in love, we are best friends. And and we've always been best friends, but very much in love. And I think that's a great combination to have both. And also, we kind of grew up together. Um, and by that, not just that we knew each other from kindergarten, but when we got married, we were still not fully grown up. I was 19. And I think, in Russ 21, and I think we really completed growing up together. And we have so many of the same interests. And I'll have to say this about Rust. He wouldn't like me to brag on him like this, but Rust has opened so many doors for me. For example, if he hadn't been on the Duke Endowment, there's no way I would be, have been on the Duke board. If he hadn't been chairman of the board at UNC Charlotte, there's no way I wouldn't have been involved out there in some significant ways. So I'm so grateful for that. But but it goes back to being best friends and best lovers. Sally, you seem just as active as you've ever been. How do you sustain the energy as a leader in the community? Well, I'm working now, I'm 85, and I'm working now on cutting back because I think it there comes a time when you need to do that. Russ is retired. He spends a lot of time at home. We love it uh, together. We spend, we want to spend more time at the breakfast table reading the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Charlotte Observer. <laughs> we just have such a great time talking and being together that I want to have full time to do that. I also want to get back more to Instead of reading board minutes and development plans, I want to get back more to, to reading 
novels and history and also having time to be with family because we're all getting old. I have four brothers in the 90s. So I'm, I'm trying to cut back. Not that I've lost interest, but I think it's a time in life to begin that. Sally, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Sally Robinson is a civic leader and community volunteer. Sally graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a bachelor's degree in history from Duke University. And now, a personal word. In 1910, E.M. Forster, a novelist, published Howard's End. The novel explores what many British novels explore, barriers of class and convention. The story has all the twists of English gentry social conflict, repressed emotions, broken engagements, sibling rivalry, social prejudices, scandal, inheritance, and complex moral resolutions. In Edwardian fashion, it all boils with the lid firmly on top of the pot. But Forster adds something new, an express theme about uniting the elements of our personality and the value of relationship. Forster says this in the voice of the novel's liberal intellectual heroine, who hopes to help her fiancé become more whole and humane. Quote, only connect. That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. In 1998, William Cronin, a professor of history, published an essay entitled, Only Connect, The Goals of a Liberal Education. Cronin posed the question, what does it mean to be a liberally educated person? He answers his question in three parts. First, noting the semantic roots of the word liberal, how it derives from the Latin and Sanskrit words meaning free and to grow. Cronin writes, quote, liberal education is built on these values. It aspires to nurture the growth of human talent in the service of human freedom. Second, Cronin explores how education has lost sight of these values in modern complex curriculum and credit hour formulas. Lastly, he offers a list of 10 qualities of a person that he would hope a liberal arts education would engender. The last on his list and the ultimate quality reads this way, quote, they follow E.M. Forster's injunction from Howard's End, only connect. More than anything else, being an educated person means being able to see connections that allow one to make sense of the world and act within it in creative ways. Every one of the qualities I have described here is, finally, about connecting. A liberal education is about gaining the power and the wisdom, the generosity and the freedom to connect. Cronin ended his essay saying this, quote, I have said that the two words only connect is as good an answer as any I know to the question of what it means to be a liberally educated person. But they are also an equally fine description of the most powerful and generous form of human connection we call love. Liberal education nurtures human freedom in the service of human community, which is to say that in the end it celebrates love. In 2019, Sally Robinson, a student of history and community volunteer, referenced E.M. Forster and Cronin's essay in conversation and declared, quote, I want to connect. She said it in the present tense, at the age of 85, leaning into the present and into the future. She said it with remarkable humility about all the connections she has made in a lifetime of civic leadership. She said it revealing without affectation all the hallmarks of a liberally educated person. Idealism, curiosity, pursuit of truth, self-criticism, pragmatism, engagement, compassion. Sally knows that the social circumstances that liberated her also binds her to the communities that gave her freedom in the first place. She exercises that freedom, making a difference in the world 
so that the world might make a difference for others. Sally is alive with the most powerful and generous form of human connection. Sally is alive with love. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.